In this video, I'd like to discuss the nature of interpersonal communication and relationships, and specifically friendships and family relationships. So let's start with friendships and, and just discussing in general, actually, the, the intimacy in close relationships and defining some of the different types of intimacy that we see in these kinds of relationships. Now, first, the dimensions of intimacy, there are really four ways that we express intimacy. Uh, the first of those is emotional intimacy. It's not a surprise probably to hear that that we express our uh, intimacy by sharing emotions that are important to us. And we share those with, with people who are close to us. And uh, and that's a way that we express intimacy, is by uh, sharing and expressing those uh, deeply held emotions. We also have, of course, physical intimacy, uh, in, in the type of uh, touching that's expressing uh, affection. And, and uh, could be uh, a sexual touch, could be just an affectionate touch, though, the way we touch uh, our, our children and our parents and things that that express emotion, but th these kinds of physical intimacy are important in relationships as well, the, the aspect of touch. Then there's also intellectual intimacy, which is the sharing of ideas. Maybe you're experiencing that in your college classes where you you have the opportunity to express ideas that are important to you and, and talk about ideas that are important to you and hear the ideas of others that are that are important to them, and we share that type of intimacy uh, and we through sharing ideas that are significant to us. And then finally, one that you may not consider either is shared activities as a way of expressing intimacy. Uh, this is more of a recent kind of uh, discovery or, or uh, you know, something that we acknowledge more recently, this idea of shared intimacy, shared activities uh, being a way of expressing intimacy. So maybe you've gone over to help a friend with a project, like building a deck, as you see here, or working on a car, or maybe just, you know, going to take a hike or going on a a canoe trip or something like that, but these types of shared activities develop intimacy. And sometimes the other factors here are, are involved in that as well, but but these shared activities, just experiencing a shared activity, having that story to share. I still talk about times, you know, with friends when, when I've gone to help them with a project or they've come over to help me with a project, and we have stories that go along with that. That's a method of, of sharing intimacy and expressing intimacy as well by engaging in those shared activities. Gender will impact how we express intimacy and how we experience intimacy, um, and, and certainly the preferences for that type of intimacy. Uh, part of it has to do with socialization and the way we've been socialized as, as men and women and male and female and, and masculine and feminine to uh, kind of generally express intimacy. Um, for example, men are, uh, traditionally have been taught to, you know, the intimacy really is reserved to those shared activities and physical intimacy and things like that. Emotional intimacy is not something that's very masculine, not something we're supposed to pursue for more masculine in nature, as opposed to femininity, where you see more emotional expression, and, you know, certainly intellectual expression, different kinds of physical expression of, of intimacy as well. Maybe just a, uh, an empathic touch and things like that. But the, So different gender people with gender identities will express intimacy in a particular way. Culture will also impact how we express intimacy and what you know, kind of are the acceptable and non-acceptable ways of expressing intimacy. Uh, you see in individualistic cultures, you see more emotional expression. Collectivistic cultures tend to be a little more reserved in their emotional expression. Um, so things like that will happen when you factor in culture. And then finally, social media will impact intimacy as well. The disinhibition effect comes in to play here where we're much more likely to uh, disclose things, quite frankly, and develop intimate relationships more quickly, especially the, the idea of emotional and, and intellectual intimacy is, is heightened through social media because of the lowering of those inhibitions with the disinhibition effect. We tend to do that uh, more quickly and, and express things with more breadth and depth. Um, on social media than we might otherwise. So um, whether or not that's healthy is another issue entirely, but, but it does happen. So social media does impact our expression of intimacy for sure. Okay, so let's focus specifically now on communication in friendships and how that works a little bit. So there are different types of friendships. You have, um, of course, as we'll talk about, you have same-sex friendships, opposite-sex friendships, you have, um, you know, friendships of acquaintance, friendships that are deeper in, in relationships, and just all different types of friendships to keep in mind. So not all friendships are the same. They're not all built the same. Um, friendships are affected by gender in communication. So um, you'll have different types of communication that exist in, for example, same-sex friendships. When you have two men who are friends or as opposed to two women who are friends, that will impact the type of communication that they have. Men men express themselves differently than they, you know, men talking to other men express themselves differently than women talking to other women. So gender will affect same-sex friendships in that way. You also have opposite-sex friendships where men and women are friends. 
and that will uh, change the kind of context and change the way that we communicate a little bit and uh, probably change the language we use and just a variety of things based on the fact that it's an opposite sex friendships and then you have the newer kind of concept of friends with benefits um, where you have friends who are also physically intimate probably with one another and, and uh, it's expected to be a non-binding kind of physical relationship and, and just something that's casual but uh, sometimes that, that happens sometimes it doesn't so you have friends with benefits though that will will affect the way that people communicate with one another as well friendships certainly affected by social media we're able to again whether or not this is good or not we're able to connect with a lot more friends because of social media we're able to maintain friendships with a lot more people um, in the past without social media people friendships kind of drift away more easily than they would uh, with social media now you're kind of on there for life if you're friends with somebody you can stay friends with them forever and now that does spread you kind of thin you don't have enough time to go around to really develop and maintain all these friendships at a really deep level so that that impacts that as well but we do have uh, social media that has impacted the idea of friendships as well friendships also governed by rules uh, to friends have different rules and some of them are, are implicit some are explicit but but some of them are very basic like friends are expected probably to be honest one another with one another and friends are expected not to to do things that would hurt another friend and, and not intentionally and not you know to make every effort not to hurt that friend and, and to not do anything hurtful there uh, but there may be some other types of uh, specific rules like maybe you have a rule that you don't date your friend's ex-boyfriend or girlfriend you're not allowed to do that uh, maybe you have a rule that uh, um, I don't know, a rule, there are probably rules on, on touching and jokes that you might be able to make. You know, maybe some friends you're able to joke around about their weight and other friends you're not. And, um, it just depends on the friendship. So um, friendships are governed by these rules, those, these expectations for our behavior and how we will um, behave with one another. So some characteristics of friendships. Um, first of all, uh, friendships have a lifespan. Not all friendships are going to be forever. Some of them will be, some of them will be lifelong friendships, but, but friendships tend to have a lifespan. We, we start with these role limited interactions, very basic, you know, we don't really know them, and that can develop if we decide that there's a, a potential there, then we decide, then we can develop those into friendly relations, maybe move toward friendship. Then you have certain rules and guidelines that govern beginning friendships when you're just beginning to be friends with somebody. Uh, and then a more stabilized friendships and then eventually though a lot of these relationships will wane for one reason or another sometimes this is uh, because you grow to dislike somebody else maybe you have a fight and maybe something negative happens and and so you end the friendship because uh, you just eventually don't like the other person but it can also be that your life circumstances change so when you're a young person when you're you know in high school and college you may have all these friends in this group of group of friends and then eventually your friends start to get married and start to have kids and their life circumstances change and maybe they move away to a different town uh, to pursue a career or whatever maybe you move away so your life circumstances change and also what you need from a friendship changes during that time as we'll discuss here in a moment but your life circumstances change and your friends are likely to change with that your friendships are likely to uh, need to adjust and change with that so so friendships will also vary at different stages of life what we need as i just mentioned a minute ago uh, what we need changes during these different stages of life uh, what we need in a childhood friendship uh, may be proximity we don't have the ability to travel we don't you know have the ability to go very far so so we're likely to be friends with people who are near us who are like to live in our neighborhood and maybe go to our school adolescent friendships maybe develop more on common interests maybe musical interests or maybe you know hobby interests and things like that but again it's going to be based on proximity probably because you're you're not able to really travel freely wherever you want. Young adult, your friendships will change again. Your, what your needs are there change into, as you're starting to have a career and starting to have a family and, and your interests are changing, your ability to, to travel and do things differently uh, and to, to expand your geographic uh, limitations for friendships are, are, are there. So it will all affect those. And then uh, we find that if we fast forward to late adulthood friendships, uh, we find that actually siblings become a very important part. If you have siblings, they become... Uh, once again, as they were in childhood, your siblings become uh, significant friends in your later years in life and come back around full circle in a sense. So friendships and what you need will vary at these different stages of life. So. Okay, shifting gears a little bit, let's talk about what makes a family and, and communication in the family in general. So what makes a family? What do we use to define family? Well, first, there are genetic ties, of course. Uh, sometimes, we're, you know, you're, you have the family that you're born into. You have a genetic tie with those people. And so that makes a family. Your family are the people that you share DNA with and that you share blood with. 
You also may have a family based on legal obligations. Maybe you've adopted a child or, or been adopted, or maybe you know through marriage that would uh, certainly be a legal obligation uh, regarding the family. So there are different legal obligations that you may have uh, as part of a family that may establish you as a family. But then also there are just role behaviors. That people who are family sometimes are just family because we treat them like family. Maybe it's a very close friend who's come to live with you or, or that you just, I mean, sometimes we define family as people who act like family and people who we treat as family, we call that role behavior. So all kinds of things that can make a family. Um, so these uh, families uh, arrange themselves in different types. We have our family of origin. That's the family we come from. That's our parents and our siblings. That's our family of origin. Uh, then we have our family of procreation, which is the family that we create, which would be our, our spouse, our children, um, people like that would be our family of procreation and they're arranged in a variety of ways we have the nuclear family the traditional you know mom dad 2.5 kids that's your your standard nuclear family you have a blended family to two adults maybe who have uh, children of their own and like the brady bunch kind of get together or or you know we see that a lot today in the blended family or you may have a single parent family where there's just one adult one parent uh, raising some children there on their own so so there are different types of families, both in family of origin and family of procreation as well. So as far as communication in the families, we create our family through communication. Family is really created through this communication. We start with family stories. You've all had stories probably that have been passed down. You hear them at every holiday, and somebody tells about what Uncle Bob did when they were a kid and, and how Grandpa uh, started his own business and did whatever. I mean, there's these family stories that kind of create who we are, give us a sense of where we come from and who our people are and who we are. And that kind of defines us. Those family stories are very important in creating a sense of family and creating that sense of connection. And we also have our family roles. Uh, maybe with your siblings, for example, you have these different family roles. I know in my family, my sister's the oldest and she's the responsible one. Anytime there's a party to plan or something significant that needs to be done, we always say, ask her. She's the responsible one. She's She's really the the one who's been in charge of things since we were kids, kind of ordering us around and bossing us around, right? That's an oldest child's obligation. And then you have uh, different roles like that. Like, I'm, uh, for example, I'm the slacker. Uh, in high school and things, I didn't really put forth as much effort as I probably could have and should have. And so I became known as a slacker. And, and even though that was a while ago and I've achieved a lot since then and changed my attitude toward these things since then, I'm still, even in middle age, in my family considered the slacker because that's the rule that I had for so many years growing up. And my sister is still the responsible one. And, and our, our other siblings have different roles too and, that have held on. And, but these roles kind of define how we communicate with our family members and, and they'll hold on for significant amounts of time. We also have family rituals. Maybe it's something simple like a family movie night every Thursday or whatever, or a game night on Tuesdays, or maybe it's just family dinners or and, and it could be arranged around a holiday. Maybe you have certain practices that you, um, you that you uh, have that you do around Christmas or around around Hanukkah or around different holidays like that that, significant, that are significant to you. Um, these family rituals they'll create um, the family through communication as well. And then finally, family secrets. These could be big things, could be small things. Sometimes family secrets are big, like somebody's in poor health or something like that, and you don't want the outside world to know. Sometimes it's little things, like don't tell dad we did this, don't tell dad we broke this window, don't tell mom this happened. Those are family secrets as well, but that can define our family through communication. For effective communication in families, we need to keep a couple things in mind. First of all, we need to manage the connection autonomy dialectic. We need to manage that idea that... that at certain times and certain people and families are going to want to be connected and um, that's particularly important around, around holidays and things like that you know thanksgiving christmas those times of year uh, when we're going to want family together and be connected during that time but there's also a sense of autonomy there's a sense of independence it's a part of i'm part of this family but i'm also my own person and i want to express that as well we need to figure out how to manage that within the family manage that connection and autonomy dialectic we also need to strive for closeness while respecting boundaries. We want to maintain that closeness with our family, but we also do need to respect that these are individuals, especially as they grow into adulthood and we can't treat them like kids forever, right? And we need to encourage confirming messages, messages that convey value as opposed to messages that convey a lack of value. Families need to focus on encouraging those, those confirming messages and positive messages toward one another. As always, if you have questions about this or any other content, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to respond and, and communicate and create a dialogue through email and so feel free to email me if you have any questions about this or anything else related to interpersonal communication that I might be able to answer for you. Thank you.